you're not allowed to leave now. But some days I want to be able to go back and watch and get recorded. It's like, ah. Oh, I am. I am. <laughs> this one just saw your music book and she goes, Peter? Who's Peter? <laughs> like, Peter Calvin? Who's that? Oh, the dad. Uh,
hear their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Eternal and all-merciful God, with all the angels and all the saints, we laud your majesty and might. By the resurrection of your Son, show yourself to us and inspire us to follow Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Saul, later called Paul, was an ardent persecutor of all who followed the way of Christ. This reading recounts the story of his transformation, beginning with an encounter with Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. 
The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be healed, filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. The word of the Lord. That Easter day with joy was bright was one of the many medieval Latin hymns that John Mason Neal translated into English. Some tradition claims that the original text was penned by Bishop Ambrose in the fourth century, and is, as in Ambrose's other works, the light of morning is a symbol for the resurrection. Today we see the light of this Sunday as well as the light throw, throwing Saul off his horse and the morning light at the sea. The hymn also refers to death, as does the gospel reading. Every Sunday worship of Christians is in some way preparation for our death. Today's psalm is Psalm number 30, be sung responsively between our two cantors.
The vision of John recorded in Revelation offers a glimpse of cosmic worship around the throne. At its center is the Lamb who was slain. The second reading is from Revelation, the fifth chapter. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. It's the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After he appeared to his followers in Jerusalem, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught, so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None, now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. 
Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and I invite our kids forward. All right. You think I'm going to tie a belt around you and take you where you don't want to go? Were you listening to the gospel? <laughs> no. What are these? Do you know what these are? Yeah, look. Acolytes wear these. Do you think someday you're going to be an acolyte? Yeah. Do you think, oh, do you think you should be trained on how to tie a rope around you so it stays up? What do you think? Here you go. Grab a rope. Yeah. There we go. Here's one. Here's one. Okay. All right. So I think you're going to best if you stand up, right? Oh, all right. Let's see. And you're going to double it up. There you go, Michael. Oh, you're not even going to try? There we go. There we go. There's another one. All right. So everyone got one that wants one? Okay. You're going to double it up. Then you're going to put it around your waist. And... Around your waist. We get, we're getting there? Around the waist. Around the waist. You got two ends like this, right? Do you know how to tie your shoes, that first tie where you go like this? Like that? Don't want it tight yet because you got to take the, the, the knotted, the two knots like this. These, these wild ones, you're going to stick them in the loop and then you're going to tighten it up. Like that. Got it? Got it? All right. And then you can just now take it off and let's try it again. Should we do it again? Okay. So it should look like this. Right? Our wonderful acolytes in training. I can hardly wait. And it'll be here before you know it. Got it like this? <laughs> First, you got to get undone, right? That's all right. Okay, so you got it around your waist like this, and then you make the first tie like, a, like you're tying your shoe, like that, and you'll have a loop. Okay, then you stick the two wild ends through the little loop to contain them, and then you tighten it up like that, right? Okay, that's pretty good, huh? Should we do it one more time? Yeah, let's do it one more time because three is kind of a magic number. Did you hear three a lot today in our gospel lesson? All right, so let's get it, our future acolytes in training and in nodding. Get around your waist again and do that first shoestring tie. Got that? And then the wild ends, the two knotted ends through the loop. Oh, you guys are, you're going to be good. There we go. Fabulous. All right, well, how did it feel to do this three? You could turn your, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> All right, you can turn your acolyte ropes in. Just thank you and have a seat. So three times, was it tiring to do it three times? Was it too much? <laughs> if you got it right away, it probably felt like too much. Then you have a little bit of idea what Peter felt like. What did Jesus ask him three times? Three times, what did Jesus ask? Do you love me? Do you love me? And what did Peter say? Yes. And then Jesus says, do you love me? What did Peter say? Yes. And the third time? Yeah, and the third time was Peter was like, 
you know, Lord, you know that I love you, right? So sometimes when we do something a bunch, we might get a little tired of it. But why do you think Jesus asked him that many times? And, the, and, and it wasn't just, do you love me? Then he said something else. Do you remember what the, if you love me, then what do you, yeah, feed my lamb, tend my sheep, take care, do something. Just like I had you guys do something in preparation for something you'll do someday. I'm sure by the time you're actually acolytes, you might have forgotten this. Do you think? Who knows? Who knows? But the thing of it is, we'll teach you again. Because that's Jesus tells us to love, and we do our loving by acting. And sometimes acting out, tending sheep, feeding sheep, is teaching them how to tie knots so ropes stay around their waist so they can be an acolyte. Yeah, isn't that cool? That we tend to each other, we do that love that Jesus calls us to do, and we do it over and over and over again. All right, so should we, should we practice something that we do every time we come here? Fold our hands and bow our head and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for learning something new and doing it again and again and again to remind us that love is in action. You love us and we love you. And we will act on that love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Yeah. Yeah, you can grab it. I'll take it. Thank you. Good job. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the giver and sustainer of our faith, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus lives, and I wonder what exciting thing is going to happen today. I wonder what new life the Holy Spirit is breathing into the walls that we are running up against the dead ends we find ourselves in before we get to the resurrection, to the new and promised life. Think about something that you have done for a long time and you know it well. But you can't go back to it and do it the same old way you did before because something has changed. You've hit a dead end. You're forced to take a different approach than would normally work for you. Take this season of Easter to explore our dead ends and wonder what exciting thing God is going to do. It is God's church, and we are God's people, and God is faithful. We keep turning toward God's abundance to see what happens next. We believe in the resurrection. We believe that new life comes out of death. And we figure out how to tell our story, our story of how we encounter death and resurrection, 
That's what we are looking for in these resurrection stories from Acts and John. We take the wisdom of what we know and then we apply it in our lives in a way for these stories to come alive in a new way. We take death and resurrection into our lives and we look expectantly for the Holy Spirit to show up because we know we do not do this alone. Remember, remember how in the book of Acts, there is this literary theme of catch and release that helps us to discover the themes of death and resurrection more fully. Because we know there is always death before resurrection. Saul was present for Stephen's stoning had heard Stephen's speech to the council. It was a community of faith at its worst. But it is often how we handle conflict in the church. There were false witnesses, there were harsh arguments, and Stephen full of grace and the Holy Spirit was able to withstand the arguments and give a speech that enraged the council. Acts chapter 6 ends with these words, And all who sat in council looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like that of an angel. Stephen's face. And he gave his speech retelling the Exodus events that ends with Stephen calling them stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, accusing them of forever opposing the Holy Spirit like their ancestors did. This enraged them. Stephen continued filled with the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. How did they respond? They covered their ears and shouting loudly, they rushed against Stephen and dragged him out of the city and stoned him. And Saul approved of their killing of him. This marks the beginning of a severe persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Saul was ravaging the church, dragging people from their homes and putting them in prison. And the followers of Jesus scattered. This isn't a pretty picture, but it is how we live together in community. It is a picture of death first before there is resurrection within the faith community. It is important for us to know this about ourselves and how we change and how we move through the horror and ugliness of death to new and resurrected life. We live with this pattern of death and resurrection. Where does this story intersect with our lives and our community of faith? How hard it is for us to hear criticism of our way of following God. How hard it is for us to trust that God might be doing something new, breathing new life into us through death to resurrection. How hard it is for us when we, like Peter, have three times over or more denied being a follower of Jesus, to sit again by a fire and be fed by him and loved by him and trust that love to move us to act by casting our net on the other side, feeding others out of the abundance we have received from God. Jesus asks us, do you love me? Yes, yes, we love you. 
Saul loves God and finds himself on the road to Damascus, a journey of 150 miles, about two weeks on the road, giving himself plenty of time to contemplate, to pray and meditate, processing Stephen's speech and Stephen's dying vision, where Stephen says he sees the glory of God, which has parallels in Ezekiel's first vision. And it wouldn't be surprising to find Saul meditating on that same passage. Saul was acting for the glory of God and felt God's glory was being dragged through the mud by these followers of Jesus. There was no room for death and resurrection in Saul's thinking. Saul needed to keep that glory before him. And the prophet Ezekiel may have been the one to help him keep his focus because Ezekiel offered a vision, a vision of God, a strange vision of the divine throne that looked like a chariot where human forms had animal features except for one. So imagine Saul on a long journey to Damascus, deep in meditation and prayer, focused on the scripture, because Saul would turn to what he knew, just like the disciples returned to what they knew, fishing. Saul was given a vision. He was given what he desperately sought. He had letters in hand to bring the followers of the way back to Jerusalem to be in prison. Now, in prayer and meditation, he had a vision. But to Saul's horror, it was the face of Jesus of Nazareth. His prayer and meditation brought him the glory of God in a face he did not want to see. It was the face and voice of Jesus, the crucified one, the one these followers of the way proclaimed. Saul hits a dead-end wall. It is his death experience. His world is turned upside down. Terror, ruin, shame, awe, horror, glory, and terror again and again sweep over him. For three days, Saul is struck blind fasting, trying to make sense of what has happened to him. Everything Saul had been taught was turned on its head. The law and the prophets had been torn to pieces and put back together in a new way. He saw the God he had loved from his childhood, the God he so desperately wanted to defend and protect, now found in Jesus risen from the dead. Three days, blind for Saul, before he experienced resurrected life. Blindness before sight. Imprisonment before release. And the release comes through Ananias. It's his only appearance. We never hear from him again. But he, it is enough for us to know that when he had a vision, he obeyed it. Even though it seemed ridiculous and dangerous, he did what he was told. He did it with grace and love as he called his past enemy Saul his brother when he laid hands on him and restored his sight. These are our stories. These are the stories that shape our us to be people of death and resurrection. Where do we connect with these stories? Where do they intersect in our lives? Which characters do we find ourselves most like? In all honesty, we're probably like the ones who have heard the news of Saul that he's coming and we're afraid. We're probably in hiding, like one of those lost Easter eggs. But we know. We know that Jesus finds us. 
we hear the stories of our world, our nation, our community. We hear the stories of the incredible shrinking church, and we are afraid. We need to hear these death and resurrection stories that and be empowered through them and find our place. It helps to hear these stories, these stories of those who face their dead end, who ran smack dab into the wall and kept turning to God and moved forward, not staying in death, but moved forward to resurrected new life. Amen. as we confess and proclaim our faith as in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy One of new beginnings, fill us with new life. Send us into the world as you sent your apostles, Philip and James, to invite people to come and see your wondrous acts in Christ. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Revive ecosystems along coastlands that have been devastated by natural forces and human negligence. God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Share a sign of God's peace with one another. all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Holy, living, and loving God, we praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. We bless you for bringing Noah and his family through the waters of the flood, for freeing your people Israel from the bonds of slavery, and for sending your Son to be our Redeemer. We give you thanks for Jesus, who, living among us, healed the sick, fed the hungry, and with a love stronger than death, gave his life for others. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. Carry us in your arms from death to life, that we may live as your chosen ones, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The risen Christ dwells here with us. All who are hungry, all who are thirsty, come. You may be seated, and those who are communing using the pre-filled cups to go ahead and pull that out and remove the seal from the wafer portion. And when you have that, if you could hold that up. This is the body of Christ given for you. And then remove the seal from the the wine or the grape juice, enough so that you can drink from it. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
please stand if you are able for our table blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the blessing you have received at his table to strengthen you to live in the power of his grace, love, and forgiveness. Amen. God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.